This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic two, marketing environment and ethics. Hey, let's take a note here for starting off at basically corporate social responsibility and, and where we go. And as you notice, the first little thing we got to deal with is profits. Everything we do is based upon profitability. We can take it from there. But as we noted in topic one, remember the, the societal marketing orientation? Long-term profitability is enhanced by always doing the right thing by everybody, your employees, uh, your customers, your partners, society, the environment, and all. Now, that last thing you noted on that, that, that graphic there, philanthropic responsibilities. Yeah, be a good corporate citizen, contribute to the community, uh, and improve quality of life. This is not to be confused with the concept of altruism. Uh, people who are certifiably sane never do things that are cross purposes to their best interests. It is in your best interest long term and in terms of profits to be acting in the right way and doing things right by people. Let's take a look at some of these ethical decision levels that we are dealing with within our society and within the business environment. Uh, the first of these, pre-conventional morality, that's kind of a child state. It's instant gratification. There's a lot of people operate that way. It's, it's what can I get away with? Dump and run, no thought of long-term relationships with people, win-lose transactions. You just not even concerned about repeat business referrals. I, I knew an organization in Atlanta that I was talking to as a potential client. They said to me, uh, our objective is to go out and sell copiers. We promise the service, but if they're having a problem with a copier, I don't care if they're about to throw it out the window. No, let them go. Go sell another copier. Oh, wow. You're not going to get a lot of referrals that way. Uh, that's a pretty easy one to spot. Some of these people, that basically their attitude is, me, 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 what can I get to satisfies me right now? The one that's sneaky is conventional morality. Do it because everybody else does it. So let's just say you're working in a healthcare situation. You have a little concern about the fact that you seem to be doing unnecessary tests and overbilling Medicare. But your boss says, hey, that's the way it's done in this industry. Whoa. When you start doing things, you know, this isn't really right, but this is the way everybody does it here, you're selling out. You're abdicating your own personal value system. Why on earth would you ever stay in an environment like that? So let me advise you. When you're on the, on the market looking for a job, check this out the very first day in the field. You're going to get the screening interview. Then you go into a day in the field with somebody. Uh, that's someone that was probably just starting that job a year or two ago. Ask them. Ask them the questions. How does our company treat each other? How do we treat uh, customers? What kind of values have we really got around here? You better hear the right answers. Otherwise, why be there? What we're really advocating as in your best interest is post-conventional morality. And that is enlightened self-interest. That's what I was referring to back in topic one when I talked to you about the Home Depot sales associate who steers my neighbor Fred to a $6.99 purchase instead of, uh, instead of 95 bucks. You will get what you want by acting in the customer's best interests at all times. Now, we've noted, I noted early on about how this can be difficult for the alcohol companies and the cigarette companies. A lot of what they're trying to do is, keep, is, is basically keep the government and the media off their ass. So they're going to, uh, basically, the, the alcoholic beverage companies, uh, they'd love to run a campaign on the lines of get drunk and be somebody. But no, that's probably not in their best interest. They're going to get in trouble on that. So they're going to take the attitude of, yeah, we got to stand for responsible behavior here. Uh, so it's just a, a, it's a touchy thing when you're looking at a product like that, which may not be in someone's best interest, but it's there. And again, raise the question, would you be comfortable working for a product like that? Well, let's take a look here at the external environment and uh, what is going on outside of our organization. And this is when you're doing a marketing plan, one of the very first things you're going to do is look at the external environment. That is everything outside your organization. What are all these things, these, these social variables, the demographics that are going on, the trends in technology, the legal environment, all these things. What's kind of funny about this 
is the elements of the external environment are often referred to as quote unquote uncontrollable variables, but organizations routinely undertake activities that attempt to shape and influence these so-called uncontrollable variables. In fact, the process of doing that is called environmental management. So what do you got out there? You got political and legal lobbying at the state level, government, you, you have federal government level, green marketing. Uh, trying to, to influence uh, the environment. Patagonia being a great example of that, of a company committed to that sort of thing. Proactively influencing social change. Having said that, uh, social variables are probably the most difficult external uh, variables to try to forecast and influence. Coming back to this, I, I know this is going to date me by telling you all about this, but I can remember this. I was sitting, oh, somewhere in the, in the mid-50s sometime, I'm just watching television, and I'm looking at TV, and I go, and I call out, Mom, Mom, there's Negroes in the commercial. Now, something you need to remember here is we're living in an age there in the mid-50s in which we are ignorant. We have never seen anybody different than us. I'm growing up in suburban Boston, 12 miles north of Boston, in a nice little suburb in the bastion of liberality out there, my town, 20,000 people, was 100% white. Um, I remember in, in about the mid-50s, Bill Russell, the center of the Celtics, wanted to move into town. Can't let him, he's black. And then they said, well, but he's Bill Russell, he's okay. That's the environment that I grew up in. Folks, I never met a black person until I went to college. I never met a gay person until I was two years out of college. We had no awareness of a world out there. I can recall Ronald Reagan was asked when he was running for president, Mr. Reagan, uh, back in the, in the days back in California there, you didn't seem to have much of a concern for some of the oppressed minorities in our society. Ronald Reagan's answer was really telling. He says, we didn't know they were there. That was the environment I grew up in. Think about this now, in the mid-50s, where 10 years before the civil rights movement really began taking traction in this country, some organization, some business organization, I have no idea who it was to this day, took on what was at that time a really revolutionary tack by presenting black families as here they are, they're families, they live in a nice home, a nice neighborhood, they're a family. That was really something that began to influence our society. And think about how proud you would have been to work for a company like that that would take a stand like that for social justice and try to educate people about the fact that, yes, there is a world out there. Um, so that's the sort of thing. You see a lot of other companies taking a role in trying to shape attitudes and, and, and considerations of other people. Now, having looked at all this stuff in the external environment, it is continuously changing and evolving, uh, as is your target market. People's tastes change. Uh, individuals move in and out of the target market, especially in dynamic and rapidly changing industries. Oh, it probably doesn't change too much in the detergent market, but fashion clothing market? Holy mackerel. You're starting in March. You got an idea of what we're going to do for our line this summer. The whole, the whole game has changed by May. So you've got to be watching the external market on a regular, ongoing basis. Here's something that can be helpful to you. Demographics. Uh, this can be just a beginning of something that you need to look at in the external environment. Now, demographics is numbers. It's pure numbers. It's a study of statistical facts like age, sex, race, location, income, family status. Now, I can take data like this. I can combine and label uh, certain demographic groups. So I got Generation X, I got Generation Y, I got the Millennials. Now, having said that, please keep in mind, not all baby boomers are the same. Uh, just like all 21-year-old college students are not all the same. And here's the thing. You may think about, well, we'll define a target market according to its demographics. We're going to look at, uh, at girls between 16 and 21. Be careful of segmenting on demographics alone. Al Rees and Jack Trout call that the demographic trap. Demographics can be a variable in, in segmenting markets, but not the only variable. Having said that, 
There are a whole bunch of products that do have a dominant demographic profile. Denture cleanser, uh, replacement knees and hips are very much oriented to old people. Uh, baby products, families with young children. Now, within our country, there are certain things to think about that have a lot of implications for us in the trends. Aging the population. Hmm, aging the population. Uh, might be some interesting implications from uh, Social Security and Medicare, right? Yeah, what are we going to do about that? We've tended to see a shift in population into the major metro areas, particularly California, Southwest, Southeast. Oh, here's another one that's happened. Women in the professional workplace. Again, going back to the 1950s, women weren't in the professional workplace. What women worked might be in teaching or nursing or something like that. Whole different game now. You have women in a professional environment. They and their husband, two income families, each of them had their own career tracks, delaying children, which, by the way, has a very significant change as a social variable. So a lot of these things that are going on um, certainly could affect the kind of products we're going to sell and how we market them. Here's another thing to look at, too, our ethnic communities and identities. Back in the old days, we thought of America as being the melting pot. Well, America is not the melting pot anymore. It's more like minestrone soup. People see themselves as having an identity of being part of a certain kind of group as well as being an American. Now, here's the thing that's interesting, too. The areas that are really growing in this country are those areas that are becoming more diverse and multicultural. And in your business, it is in your own enlightened self-interest to embrace diversity. Hey, it's, uh, it's pretty simple, folks. How do you think that you can properly segment and target markets and then properly exploit the attendant opportunities if 90% of your executives are white, Anglo-Saxon, heterosexual, male Protestants when that represents exactly 25% of the marketplace? You can't do it. So last thing we look at here, let's look at some of the federal regulatory agencies that we need to deal with. First one, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. These guys are in charge of protecting the health and safety of consumers using products around the home. So say you've got to sell a new lawnmower. Only one little problem with a lawnmower. The lawnmower, instead of aiming the debris and stuff sort of down a little bit, aims it up at about a 20 degree angle. So if uh, someone's riding a bicycle by your house as you're mowing the lawn or they're walking by, you just blast them with a degree. Uh, that, that's Consumer Product Safety Commission going to handle that. Or we had recently um, Chinese toys with lead paint. We're going to get later on in the course talking about some things about outsourcing production and all that. Hey, folks, if you're outsourcing your production and going into, say, having it made some other place like China, you better have somebody to double check and make sure exactly what the ingredients are and what's going into that product. So don't have it be putting lead paint on it. Uh, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, um, those guys are dealing with unfair trade practices, including antitrust and deceptive advertising. So there was an internet service provider, Juno, that a few years back uh, basically gave you a free trial promo. You can try our internet service for a free trial. There's only one problem. The only way that you could decide to opt out after the free trial was by calling an 800 number which was unpublished and was unavailable at their internet site. <clears throat> no, can't do that. You've got to make that thing available. Now within this, here's something to get to look for in marketing. Uh, and you're starting watching commercials and all. You should, by the time you take this course, you kind of look at things a little differently. Corrective advertising clarifies statements that are deemed to have been misleading. Look for these little qualifiers that people make in statements. Uh, what, what you'll have something like, um, well, this product alone, of course, will not prevent heart attack. Yeah, the, the, this product alone kind of implies that their earlier message of saying it would. Oh, this one I just saw recently. Um, it's, it's a beach scene. Uh, out of the surf, this, this lovely babe comes running out of the surf, just bouncing up to the camera, and she says something like, well, of course, Fat away alone will not help you lose weight. It's all part of uh, good exercise, uh, diet, uh, good rest, and all the lifestyle choices and stuff like this. Uh, the one they really nail you on is called cease and desist. That means stop it, stop it now. Um, Campbell's soup got nailed on that. If you've had the experience of the condensed soup, 
you know, you'd put in the can, they pour a can of water. It's kind of watery and all that. What they were doing in their commercials is they were putting glass marbles on the bottom of the bowl. So you pour the soup in and fire and run the commercial. It looks like these ingredients are piled up all over the top. No. Knock it out. You can't do that. And now here's one uh, closer to home as well. Uh, back in my days, my baseball days at Wrigley Field in Chicago, um, I was out there one day, came, came out of the game, uh, walking by, and there's some of these independent vendors selling T-shirts out on the, uh, the, uh, on the sidewalk out there at, uh, at Clark and Addison. So I see, I see one, and he's got some, uh, <clears throat> some Bart Simpson T-shirts. And he's got one I liked. It was, um, had Bart there, and it says, and there's Bart Simpson standing there, and he's got, he's got something that says, Cub fan, Bart man. And on his T-shirt says, don't have a cow, Harry. Sort of from back in the days of Harry, Carrie, and Holy Cow. I like that one. I got one of those. Oh, and the other one I really love. It's Bart. He's standing there facing you with one. He's in a suit. He's in a coat and tie. And he's looking very, very uncomfortable, looking forward. And the, the caption says, this is Bart. And the back of it, here's Bart. He's in cutoffs and a t-shirt. His eyes are all bloodshot. He's giving the Hawaii hiya hiya sign. And uh, he's smoking a joint. And it says, this is Bart on drugs. And on his t-shirt it says, any questions? Now. What do you think was the reaction of the copyright holders of The Simpsons when they found out about these t-shirts? Yeah, they weren't very happy about that at all. So you figure the t-shirt guys will just say to them something like, well, let us just sell out our inventory and uh, we won't do it anymore. No, 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 no. no you, you're not doing it at all. You are to stop it right now. You sell one more t-shirt, you're going to jail. Um, I think what they did let them do on things like that, by the way, and they had that, that terrible earthquake down in Haiti, is they let them sell t-shirts like that down there, copyright violations, but at least give the people uh, something they could wear. But no, no, you're not going to sell any more of these things, absolutely not. Um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the last agency we live with, um, safety of food and drug products. We had a few years back the salmonella-based peanut butter. Oh, that's the FDA handled that one. Diabetes drugs, increasing heart risk, yeah, that's a problem. Or we had, uh, again, real close to home here, uh, one of my friends at the Ensley Senior Center, Maud Frump, um, her cat, Fluffy, she fed that cat um, some of that Chinese pet food. Um, that was the end of the flufferoo. And uh, shouldn't have bought that Chinese pet food. Anyhow, that's topic two. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.